So we've seen the main views concerning the timing of the rapture, and it's important to recognize that within each position, not all adherents agree with every single thing that other adherents say or believe concerning that view. But I do believe we've represented these different views fairly and accurately in, in the broad strokes of each view. Um, we need to value the academic side of studying scripture. Every Bible translation you hold, whether it's the King James, New King James, New American Standard, English Standard Version, Holman Christian Standard Bible, whatever the translation, that is the work of scholars, of academics who have studied these languages of Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic for years. And these people are theologians. Not, it, there is an interpretive aspect to translating scripture. It's not as simple as finding an English, the English equivalent of the Greek or Hebrew word. There is the work of interpretation that goes into the work of translating scripture. And so we cannot despise the academic side of studying scripture. But Jesus said that when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide us into all truth. And so if we want to be led into all truth, we need to seek the Lord to reveal his truth to us by his spirit. We need to be seeking for the illumination of the spirit and not trusting in our own abilities of being able to read a text alone. So we need to seek the Lord. And um, maybe you have been brought up with a particular view of the rapture, and that's predominantly what you've known and you've embraced it, because that's what you were taught in your early Christian walk. I want to challenge you to relook at it. Maybe you'll come to understand exactly the same and your understanding will be confirmed. Maybe you will be challenged. But we need to desire to know the truth on this subject. And, and as we go and look and study to see what Scripture really says, there are certain caveats that we should bear in mind as we look at the timing of the rapture. And that's really what this session is about. It's about bearing certain principles in mind in our own study as we prayerfully seek the Lord to reveal His truth to us. first point is the timing when it happens is not the most important thing there are two things that are the most important thing that we need to emphasize so number one two times important things that we need to stress the first number a is and they're both to do with readiness. Ready for Jesus' return. Ready for rapture. Be ready at all times. Live today as if it's your last. We need to emphasize this. Be ready. Today, Lord, if you take me home, I want to be, I don't want to be ashamed. I want to be ready for your return. Be ready for persecution don't ever even if you're a pre-trib rapture person don't ever 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 believe that jesus has promised to get you to escape from suffering for him live as if you're going to see this great tribulation right at the end with antichrist that he's going to behead your head. Come to terms with the fact that Jesus has not called us to escape. He's called us to endure. If you hold those two things together, it really doesn't matter where you believe the rapture is. Second point. Well, let's do it in the red one. Okay, second point is where is the and I'm just gonna put it in in this 
in this way. Where is the day of the Lord? When does it begin? Now, when we read in Revelation chapter 6, it says, Hide us from the, the, uh, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? The day of the Lord is the time of the wrath. It's the day of the Lord, the day of His wrath. Okay, so the day of the Lord, when does it begin? Is it, does it begin right at the beginning? Does it begin with the abomination of desolation? Does it begin, or does it just happen right at the end? That will affect where you put the timing of the rapture. Because the timing of the rapture would precede it. So let me write this down very, very quickly. So if the day of the Lord starts at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, then the rapture would begin there. If the day of the Lord begins at the middle point, then the rapture would happen here. If the day of the Lord happens somewhere around here, then the rapture would happen here. If the day of the Lord is just right at the end, then it would happen there. Or according to the pre-trip person, that wouldn't even matter because you're going to be kept anyway within it. But for me, the important thing is when does the day of the Lord begin? Because I believe as, as the flood came, they got into the ark and then the flood came. When the fire came to Sodom, they were pulled out of the city, then the fire fell. There's this pattern they took out. The final, the great finale of the flood, Israel passed through first, then the others were swamped by the thing, but Israel had to go through it first, had to go to the other side before the others were swept away. So there is a removal at some point that precedes the outpouring of wrath. Right. The third point we need to ask is, this is when you read the Old Testament, so you might not come to a decision for years. But this is something to always bear in mind. When you read in the Old Testament, so Old Testament, when you read in the Old Testament a section that talks about the day of the Lord. So it says the day of the Lord is like this, and the day of the Lord is like that. Day of Lord passages, day of the Lord passages. <laughs> Make a list of what you learn about the day of the Lord. What does it say about the day of the Lord? When you make this list, make sure you have the reference of what you're looking at, say Joel 2 or whatever. What does it say happens before the day of the Lord begins? As well. So I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So now you know, before Elijah comes first, then the day of the Lord comes after. Who's Elijah? Then it will help you to time the the great the, the, the day of the Lord. There's another scripture that says the sun will turn to darkness and the moon will become blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So where does that happen? Where does the moon get turned to blood? Then you'll know. Well, that happens. After that happens, then the day of the Lord can begin, because that's a sign. That happens before the day of the Lord. So that will help you to time the day of the Lord. Make a list of the things that happen inside the day of the Lord. And then when you go to Revelation, see where those things are. Maybe they happen several times. Which one is the fulfillment of what you're reading? So those are the kind of things that you're going to have to look at. The day of the Lord passages in the Old Testament. And in the New. But there's a lot in the Old You'll study it and you'll come to your own understanding because God will show you through His Word. And fourthly, is that this is a practical point. Jesus gives a parable and He says, He's going to be, that servant is going to be blessed. He's busy about His Master's business when the master comes. 
It doesn't matter so much how much of the theory we know about the last days. What we should be getting from here is, yo, when it happens, it's happening quickly. And when we look at the world around us today, we're seeing signs that we're fast approaching the end. The closer, if we've got Jesus' return here, and him going to heaven here, and this is the time of the apostles, and this is, say, the Middle Ages, and here we are, how close are we? Much closer than all of those other people. But maybe we're not that close. Maybe we're even closer. That means we have a window period of this much time to serve the Lord. To see, you know, here's the thing. If you knew your mum or your dad or your brother or sister, and I'm speaking to myself here, was going to breathe their last tomorrow, what would you do about it? What would you, and we're always, this is personal because we've, we've faced this. I'm extending that beyond our family. We live, God's placed us in Belito, He's placed us in different places. We have a short time to serve the Lord. And we can only serve the Lord according to His strength and His grace and His opening of opportunities. We can't force the gospel on anybody. But we need to be busy about our master's business. Time is short. If you are a farmer and you are a little bit late in sowing your fields, and time is short, what do you do? You hold up your hands and say, oh, you're just kind of so late, why bother? You work harder because you want the harvest. So it's like, okay guys, we've got to roll up our sleeves, we've got to get down to this, because time is short. The rains are coming, we need to get this done now. This needs to be what end times is about. Ready to serve the Lord, ready for His return, ready to suffer for Him, living life, not in the, with just the theory of it, but saying, Lord, Make me your servant. Make me your vessel. Make me ready. Help me, Lord Jesus. I want, I'm putting on my armor today. I want to be ready to fight in the evil day. Make me strong. Help me to endure. Give me strength. I'll keep the word of your perseverance. You keep me in the hour. Help, give me that strength to not deny your name and to stay faithful to you. And if, you, and if that's your attitude, the Lord will keep you. By his grace, he will keep you from that hour of testing that's coming upon the face of the earth. Why? Because he's done it before and he'll do it again. So bearing these caveats in mind, we are now challenged to search scripture and to see what the biblical position is. Um, we need to look at what other people say. We're placed in a body. Different people are studying the scripture and people are reading scripture, sometimes according to a bias, sometimes because they're seeing certain things in scripture and we need to sharpen one another according to the word. And to sharpen one another, we really have to listen to one another. There are people who have studied much of scripture, who have taught scripture, who have been used by the Lord to touch others with their teachings and their preaching. But our teacher is the Lord. God is our teacher. And so we do need to listen to one another, but at the end of the day, we need to seek the Lord and say, Lord, by your spirit, open my eyes, reveal to me your truth. I want to know your truth. And therefore, we mustn't be uncritical. You'll see as we looked at the different views, there's things about each view. It seems to be correct. It seems to um, stand up to scripture because it seems to be what scripture is saying. And when we are easily swayed by, by persuasive arguments, that's where the confusion will come in because, well, that sounds convincing, and but the other person is saying things that sound convincing and the other person. And so this just exposes our need to really hear from the Lord. Sometimes we follow a view because that's what we were taught. And um, that was the line our church had and we really haven't questioned it. So it's worth questioning um, these different views and, and hearing from the Lord. So 
for those who are interested in looking at these different views and what they teach and the scriptures and the arguments that these people use, um, I'm going to recommend certain books that will give you an accurate view of what they believe on the, on the understanding that these, script, these books are not authoritative. These books are books about the book and its scripture that we have to deal with. So from the pre-tribulation position, um, there's um, John Walvoord, who's one of the main, um, been one of the main pre-trib um, authorities. Um, his book is called The Rapture Question, and um, he is arguing for a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Um, but even better than him, there's another guy called Arnold Fruchtenbaum. And this is a good book to read, The Footsteps of the Messiah. It's not about the rapture. It's about the book of Revelation. But he has a lot about the tribulation and about the rapture in it. And you can go to the index at the back and you can see the scriptures that concern his view of the rapture. And what I like about Arnold Fruchtenbaum is this, that he is completely consistent with his pre-tribulational position in such a way that if you contradict Arnold or you don't agree with Arnold on certain things, you would actually undermine the pre-tribulational position. And for, for reasons that I've already given, such as um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum is very clear to say that Elijah is not one of the two witnesses because um, Elijah comes before the day of the Lord. And according to his presupposition, um, the day of the Lord um, covers the whole of the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks, the whole seven years, and therefore Elijah has to come before there. Um, if Elijah was one of the two witnesses, it would push the day of the Lord further into the seven years, past the halfway point. Um, so that is one of the things to, um, um, to bear in mind, that Arnold is pretty much, I would say, an authority on the pre-tribulation position. Uh, for the mid-tribulation position, you can read Norman Harrison, The End, I, Rethinking the, Rev, the Revelation. And um, I don't know how um, obtainable his book is, but this is a, this is a pr mid-tribulation position. From the pre-wrath side, we have um, Marvin Rosenthal, and he wrote a book called The Pre-Wrath pre Rapture of the Church. And this book is um, worth reading because... Marvin Rosenthal used to be a pre-tribulational um, rapture adherent. He was running a ministry or heading up a ministry, and he was challenged on his view of the rapture. And when he came to understand it as a pre-wrath rapture, he, was basi he basically had to step down from the, the, his ministry. In fact, what's interesting is that Arnold Fruchtenbaum has written a critique um, against this book, um, and, and what is very interesting is Arnold Fruchtenbaum normally is very much um, systematic and very much in his head and not really, he doesn't really make emotive arguments. He doesn't really um, go to say, or he doesn't really say anything kind of derogatory about people. But um, for some reason, when he critiques this, he accuses Marvin Rosenthal of being puffed up with pride because Marvin said the Lord led him on this path and the Lord showed him these things. And it's almost like, who do you think you are, Marvin, that God, God allegedly reveals this to you, which is very unusual, a very unusual term for Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who usually is very kind of academic and um, non-emotive. And then also from a pre-wrath position, but not really position, but the timing of the rapture, there's Jacob Prash. Harpazzo, um, this is not a book proving a pre-wrath timing. He assumes a pre-wrath timing. He is expounding his understanding of the rapture from Old Testament types to what scriptures say about a rapture to um, patterns in scripture that speak about a rapture. But he is assuming a pre-wrath rapture. He's not defending it and he's not attacking the other views. And so this book will give you a very, very deep um, insight into um, truths that concern the rapture. And, and Jacob Presh doesn't call himself a pre-wrath rapture adherent, and it's important to recognize that. He calls himself intraseal. 
and interest seal is the same timing of the rapture, but he won't class himself as pre-wrath because the certain things the pre-wrath adherents teach that Jacob disagrees with, such as the identity of the restrainer. Jacob, like the pre-tribulation rapturists, believe that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Most pre-wrath adherents teach that it is the archangel Michael, and so therefore Jacob wants to give his position a different name to pre-wrath, but the timing basically is the same timing. And then from a post-tribulation position, we have George Eldon Ladd, the Blessed Hope. Um, and what I like about this is right at the end, um, Ladd turns around and says, pre-trib view, pre-tribulation view should not be a test of orthodoxy and neither should post-tribulation view be a test of orthodoxy. And I just want to emphasize that, that we are to discuss and debate the timing of the rapture. And we can even discuss it with animation and, and um, persuasion and with a certain amount of um, enthusiasm and passion. That's fine. But we are brothers in Christ. This is not an issue for division. So no matter how excited we get, we need to embrace each other, give each other a hug and accept that fellowship that we have in Christ, because there are bigger fish to fry. There is issues of ecumenism. There are issues of the, the word of faith movement. There is issues of the false signs and wonders movement. There are real issues to divide over. This is not one of them. Normally, I don't go for this kind of argument that there's more that unites us than divides us. But in this case, it is so true. We are all millennial. We believe that Jesus is going to bring his kingdom on earth. We believe that God has purposes for Israel as a nation, even if some people believe Israel will come into the church. Um, we believe that God is going to um, fulfill many Old Testament prophecies, and we believe in a rapture. So we shouldn't divide over the timing of the rapture. Um, it's so important to keep the, the, the bond of love in peace or the bond of peace in love. We need to and make sure that the tone is not pejorative, which means that we're not attacking people, we're discussing the ideas. Um, if you just want an overview and you don't really want to mine all this stuff, but you do want to look at um, some of what, or s some of what people say concerning their, vi their views of the rapture, there's this book by Millard Erickson, Contemporary Options in Eschatology, and he has a section on the rapture, and he gives all the main views except for pre-wrath. But he gives um, what's called a mid-tribulation view, which we looked at. But he also gives another one which we didn't look at, which is called the partial rapture theory. Um, by looking at these things and looking at the arguments, at the end of the day, we go back to Scripture and we say, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, open my eyes. Let me see the truth. I only want your truth. And the Lord will lead us forward and onward. In the next session, we're actually going to look at Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, and we're going to see how that will help us to understand the timing of the rapture, at least from the way I'm reading it. But I believe that this is what the Lord is saying, and He's shown us um, the truth. So, as always, test these things to see if these things be so. God bless.